Good evening aspirants, welcome to Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar Ayes Academy. Today's date is 25th March 2024. Displayed here are the list of topics we are going to see today. Now without wasting any time, let us get into the discussion. Look at this article, recently Chief Election Commissioner Rajiv Shukla made provisions for postal voting of voters who are above 85 years and also for the people with disability. So these people will constitute roughly around 88 lakh voters. This postal vote system is also called vote from home system which is made with the intention to make elections more participative and inclusive. Before moving further with our discussion, we need to understand that the disability mentioned here should not be less than 40% and that too needs to be certificated by a medical practitioner. Now in this discussion, let us understand in brief about the voting provisions for different sections of people which is important for our prelims and mains exam. First let us start with how postal voting facility works. See in order to avail this facility, the concerned voter need to fill the form 12D to assistant returning officer. After filling this form, two polling officials accompanied by a videographer and a security person will visit the electors home and they oversee the postal ballot voting process. This facility has been extended to media persons who are covering the polling day and the essential service workers involved in metros, railways and healthcare. The option is also open for service voters such as personnel of armed forces who are posted away from their hometowns. Now moving further, let us see how internal migrants vote. Know that according to 2011 census, the number of internal migrants stands at 450 million, which is 45 percentage surge from 2001 census. The election commission has earlier formed a committee called Committee of Officers on Domestic Migrants. In order to ensure the ease of voting, the committee report submitted a solution in the form of remote voting. Remote voting refers to all means which allow voters to vote from locations other than the polling station assigned to them. The remote voting location can either be abroad or from within the country. But as of now, it is still a plan under consideration. Now let us understand the existing provisions and future plans regarding NRI voters. NRIs have right to vote in Indian election, but the process has certain limitations and conditions. They can participate in elections by registering as voters in their constituency. However, they are required to be physically present at the respective polling stations to cast their vote. The Indian government has been considering proposals to enable NRIs to vote through postal ballots or online voting, but till date no significant changes has been implemented. Now moving ahead, let us understand the voting rights of prisoners. See, convicted persons in India do not have right to vote. Once a person is convicted of criminal offence and sentenced by the court, they lose their right to participate in electoral process. This is until the completion of their sentence, including any period of imprisonment. Under trial prisoners who are individuals detained in custody have the right to vote. They are considered eligible voters unless otherwise disqualified due to reasons such as non-residence or mental incapacity. So under trial prisoners also have right to vote. So these are the important things we need to understand from this article. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. Look at this article, there was a recent controversy surrounding the conduct of governors and in latest instance, TN governor refused to allow re-induction of a minister back into the cabinet. So this has also sparked controversy. In our analysis, let us see about the relevance of governor's post for our exam. Firstly, governors are important for ensuring the parliamentary form of government in the state level. We know a parliamentary form of government should have a nominal and real executive. So governor as a nominal head is an important part of it. Secondly, he plays an important role in bridging the centre and state relationship. As he is appointed by the centre and have a positive rapport with them, his crucial role with regard to bridging the centre and the state is important. The relevance of the office can be understood with the help of Article 163. This article gives discretion to the governor in the following areas which are very crucial for the functioning of democracy. Appointing a chief minister when no party has a clear majority in the state legislative assembly, the governor has discretionary power. In case of failure of constitutional machinery in the state, under Article 356, there are discretionary powers for governors. The power to withhold assent to the bill and reserve a bill for consideration of president, he has discretionary powers. This is mentioned under Article 200 and 201. These were given to balance the autonomy of state with the unity and integrity of the nation. Governor in most of the cases act as a chancellor of universities in the states. So he can act as a bulwark in ensuring the independence of institutions 
by insulating the political appointments. In many cases of corruption, the assent of governor is mandatory to pursue cases against incumbent or ex-ministers or CMs. So he acts as a forum for complaint by the opposition to ensure check and balance in the government. In the events of extraordinary situations like political instability or breakdown of law and order, he will play a crucial role. The governor can recommend president's rule in the state if such a situation arises. Lastly, governors represent the ceremonial and symbolic aspect of governance in the state. He participates in state functions, events and ceremonies representing the dignity and authority of the state. So these are the important points regarding the relevance of governor in present times. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next news article discussion. Look at this article. It highlights the critical issue of coral reef degradation due to the factors like global warming and ocean acidification. So in this news article discussion, let us understand the basics about corals and major threats to corals. Corals are skeletons of tiny marine animals called polyps. They flourish in shallow, mud-free and warm waters. Most of the time, corals remain in symbiotic relationship with a single-celled algae called zooxanthellae. This is a photosynthetic algae. Zooxanthellae performs photosynthesis and the energy generated through photosynthesis provides corals with the energy required for growth, reproduction and construction of calcium carbonate skeletons. So corals have calcium carbonate skeletons. The pigments in zooxanthellae also give colors to corals. So in return, coral polyps provide a protected environment for zooxanthellae. And the waste products like nitrogen and phosphorus released by corals are used as nutrients by this zooxanthellae algae. Corals also have ability to secrete calcium carbonate through a process called biomineralization. This leads to formation of their hard external skeletons which provide support and protection for soft coral polyps. The skeletons are composed primarily of aragonite or calcite, two crystal forms of calcium carbonate. Over time, as coral colonies grow and reproduce, the accumulation of calcium carbonate skeletons forms vast underwater structures known as coral reefs. There are three main types of coral reefs, fringing reefs, barrier reefs and atolls. Now let us see the threats faced by coral reefs. Firstly, climate change and its impact on coral reefs. With the rising global temperature, mass coral bleaching events and infectious disease outbreaks have become important threat to corals. Here the coral bleaching occurs when coral lose their pigmented zooxanthellae algae. Secondly, ocean acidification. It refers to a reduction in pH of ocean over an extended period of time. This is caused primarily by uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere. So this reduces the availability of carbonate ions in seawater. These carbonate ions are essential building blocks for corals to form calcium carbonate skeletons. As a result, corals experience decreased rate of calcification, hindering their ability to build and maintain skeletal structures. Thirdly, increased frequency and intensity of tropical storms can lead to coral breakage, dislocation and degradation from wind and waves. Finally, marine pollution is also an important threat to coral reefs. The zooxanthellae loss occurs during the exposure of coral to increased concentrations of various chemical contaminants. The plastic and garbage at seaside often end up in the sea and it disrupts the coral reef's delicate environment. Apart from this, overfishing and destructive fishing practices, coral mining, sedimentation, poorly managed tourism are also some other important threats faced by corals. So with this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. Look at this editorial article, March 24 was celebrated as World TB Day to improve awareness about TB and its issues. So this article talks about the public health challenges created by TB. Despite various ambitious goals, India still cannot eradicate TB. So in this context, let us discuss a main question regarding this topic. Now before getting into the discussion, look at the syllabus. It comes under GS paper 2. Now look at the main question. In spite of various efforts and policies, tuberculosis is still a major problem in India. Discuss various reasons for this. Give some solutions to prevent tuberculosis. Let us start with the introduction. In the time between 2010 to 2020, 1.5 million people have died every year because of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is killing poor Indians who are crippling in their livelihood. In this context, it is important for us to understand the TB. TB is an infectious bacterial disease caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Know that they commonly affect the lungs but can also damage other parts of body. It is a serious socio-economic health issue for India due to the scale and impact of the problem it has created. So in our discussion, let us see the challenges of India to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal 3.3 which is ending the epidemic of tuberculosis by 2030. Now let us move on to the body part of the answer. In the first part, we are going to discuss about the challenges in combating TB. Firstly, with reference to high burden of TB cases. See, according to WHO Global Tuberculosis Report 2023, for the first 
first time, 7.5 million patients were diagnosed with TB in 2022. And out of this, India accounts for 28% of all TB cases in the world. So, this has increased the burden of India. Secondly, with respect to poverty. See, poverty as a socio-economic factor plays a major role in influencing the conditions of millions of people in India. It limits the accessibility to health care and necessary food items required for nutrition. So, poverty has brought undernourishment and unhygienic living conditions which makes TB even worse. Then there was a recent trend of drug-resistant TB which is growing in India. Know that India has high burden of drug-resistant TB which is more difficult and costlier to treat than regular TB. This problem is peculiar to India as we have indiscriminate use of antibiotics and have created antimicrobial resistance. Moving on, we are having limited access to healthcare. The diagnosis test for TB have increased and their cost have increased. So the usage of these tests is limited to their higher cost and issues with the accessibility. The rural India does not have access to quality healthcare facilities and also they cannot afford costlier medical care and diagnosis. So this results in delay in diagnosis and treatment and also leads to the spread of TB. Finally, like all other diseases, TB is associated with stigma and discrimination. So many people are reluctant to disclose their illness or seek treatment due to the fear of discrimination or social isolation. So these are the important challenges regarding tuberculosis in India. With this, let us conclude the first part of the body of the answer. Now moving on to the second part where we shall talk about the solutions to this problem. First of all, we should implement a comprehensive TB control program. This will cover the entire value chain of TB management from early detection to screening, treatment, post-treatment, follow-up, etc. Then we should focus on early detection. This is because most of the symptoms are often ignored and mistaken for other common ailments. Moreover, compulsory screening for family and contacts of each individual is essential. The motto of our TB program should be, if we cannot find TB, we can not treat TB. And if we cannot treat TB, we cannot end TB. Thirdly, we should sensitize the healthcare providers to various issues faced by the patients and ensure they act in non-discriminatory manner. Simultaneously, we must provide both treatment and legal literacy to people with TB so that they can understand their rights and speak of if they are violated. Fourthly, we should expand the access to healthcare. See, efforts should be made to expand the access to healthcare facilities, particularly in rural areas where the accessibility is limited. In this aspect, Ayushman Bharat and health and wellness centers are a good starter. Finally, addressing the socio-economic determinants of TB requires a multi-sectoral approach. See, the steps like poverty elevation, improvement in nutritional status, well-ventilated housing and better air quality will contribute as a part of eliminating TB. So, this is all about the body part of the answer. Now, we have come to the conclusion part. Tuberculosis remains the biggest killer disease in India. It affects the lives and livelihoods of people and downtrodden people. India should strive to eradicate TB through collective action with aid from various fields like technology, civil society, poverty reduction schemes, etc. Moreover, we should make it as a mass movement with role model people who overcome TB to improve the public understanding of TB. This will reduce stigma and prevent discrimination and eventually we can end TB in India within 2030. So this is all about the discussion. Now let us move to the next news article. Look at this article. It talks about Nisar satellite. This satellite is expected to take off in the first quarter of 2024, but its launch has been postponed due to lack of a key component. So, this is the crux of the article given here. In this backdrop, let us learn about Nizar from our Pulim's perspective. Nizar is expanded as NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar. It is a joint Earth observing mission between NASA and ISRO. The goal is to make global measurements of the causes and consequences of land surface changes using advanced radar imaging. So, NISAR will be the first radar in space to systematically map Earth using two different radar frequencies, that is L band and S band. This allows NISAR to measure changes of our planet's surface, including movements as small as 1 cm. Once launched, NISAR will map the entire globe in 12 days. Remember, this joint mission was signed in 2014 and it is expected to be launched this year. While NASA is providing the mission's L-band synthetic aperture radar, a high-rate communication subsystem for scientific data, that is GPS receivers, are provided by ISRO. ISRO is also providing the spacecraft, S-band radar, launch vehicle and associated launch services. So, these are the contributions made by ISRO and NASA. Now, what are the benefits of NISAR? NISAR will provide a wealth of data and information about Earth's surface changes, natural hazards and ecosystem disturbances. 
This mission will provide critical information to help manage natural disasters such as earthquakes, tsunamis and volcanic eruptions. NISAR data will be used to improve agriculture management and food security by providing information about crop growth, soil moisture and land use changes. This mission will provide data for infrastructure monitoring and management such as monitoring of oil spill, urbanization and deforestation. NISAR will help to monitor and understand the impacts of climate change on Earth's land surface including the melting of glaciers, sea level rise and changes in carbon storage. So these are the benefits of NISAR. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. Now look at this news article, it talks about an anemia study conducted across 8 states in India which involves 4613 participants. So in this news article discussion, let us understand the findings of the report. See the results found that prevalence of anemia in the country has been overestimated by previous surveys. This is especially by National Family Health Survey. The reason for this overestimation is due to use of wrong sample collection method. Usually the sample for anemia test is collected directly from the veins. But the National Family Health Service measured hemoglobin using finger prick based capillary method. So the method used was wrong. So we have been overestimating the anemia in the country. Now let us discuss about the basics of anemia. See anemia is a problem of not having enough healthy red blood cells in the body. So if you have too few or abnormal red blood cells or not enough hemoglobin, there will be a decreased capacity of blood to carry oxygen to the body tissues. So this results in the symptoms such as fatigue, weakness, dizziness and shortness of breath. The factors causing anemia is given here, you can go through it. Now let us see the statistics found in the report. The recent study found that prevalence of anemia in sample population was predominantly mild with 18.4% of entire sample being mildly anemic and 14.7% is moderately anemic and only 1.8% are severely anemic. Also note that anemia was more prevalent among women compared to men. Specifically, the prevalence of moderate anemia was significantly higher in women compared to men. And even in that, anemia prevalence was highest among adolescent girls followed by elderly women and adult women. Among men, the anemia prevalence was comparatively lower with adolescent boys at 24% and adult men at 21% and elderly men at 37%. So these are the important findings of the recent report. Now we have come to the prelims practice question discussion. Look at the first question. It is about NISAR. Look at the first statement. It is a joint earth observation mission by ISRO and NASA. Yes, this statement is correct. It will be able to observe minor changes in land, vegetation and cryosphere. Yes, this statement is also correct. It is a dual band radar imaging mission. This is also correct. We have seen these all in discussion. So the correct answer is option C, all three. Now look at the second question. It is about coral reefs. What type of corals are found very close to the land and forms a shallow lagoon known as boat channel? The correct answer is option B, fringing reef. See, fringing reefs grow directly from the shoreline of land mosses such as islands or continents. They are characterized by their proximity to the shore and the shallow lagoon that forms between the reef and the land. Now look at the third Third question, consider the following statements in the context of interventions being undertaken under Anemia Mukbarat strategy. It provides prophylactic calcium supplementation for preschool children, adolescents and pregnant women. This statement is incorrect. Prophylactic ion folic acid supplementation and not prophylactic calcium supplementation. Now look at the second statement. It runs a campaign for delayed cord clamping at the time of childbirth. This is a correct statement. Now look at the third statement. It provides for periodic deworming to the children and adolescents. This statement is also correct. It addresses non-nutritional cases of anemia in endemic pockets with a special focus on malaria, hemoglobinopathies and fluorosis. This statement is also correct. So the correct answer is option C, only 3. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.